All right, let's talk about extraction of a tooth that's horizontally, has a horizontal root fracture, bone grafting, and then placement of a root form implant, abutment, and crown. This is one implant case. If you want to see multiple implant cases involving every scenario, subscribe to dentistrymasterclasses.com on the link below. Here's our tooth and here's our final restoration. So this tooth had fractured horizontally right at the tip, at the apical uh, portion of the post. And here's my final implant and screw retained abutment and crown. Local anesthesia. Now I'm not removing the entire tooth. I know only the coronal part of the tooth is going to be extracted because of the horizontal fracture. See the fracture. So we're going to use the easy extract extraction system. I couldn't practice without this. When you've broken off, especially a cuspid tooth is fractured at the gum line. It's, all, it's practically impossible to remove that root unless you remove a lot of facial bone. Or if you're going to place an implant, that's not good because you want to preserve the bone around the tooth. Now in the case of this extraction, much of the buccal bone, the facial bone was already gone. But this system removes that root straight out of the socket so you preserve the facial and the lingual or palatal bone. So I'm measuring the length of the tooth from the fracture to the apex of the tooth. This is the easy, first drill of the Easy Extract system and I've got an endo stop on the first drill so I don't penetrate very much past the apex of the tooth. I'm reflecting this tissue just to see what the alveolar crest around the tooth looks like and see if it's intact. So there's three drills with the system. This is the second drill. and you're just drilling straight into the root canal. And then you screw this extractor post into the, the hole that you drill into the uh, endocanal. This is super fast set blue mousse, and you squirt this into the tray. That extraction post is gonna go through this hole, and this blue mousse is gonna fit on the teeth adjacent to the extraction site. And you put that to place. Now it's very important before this sets up, you place the extractor and try it in to the screw because you want this part to fit like that. And if you don't set the tray correctly, there may not be enough room or there may be too much room for this extractor. You want it to just barely slide in there so you've got maximal space to extract the tooth root Then let this sit for a minute and then you've got a little knob down here that you screw and as you screw this remember righty tighty as you screw this to the right it moves this up slowly wedging against the teeth on each side so it's pulling it straight out and screw it for a while until it gets tight and then pause. And what I'll do is screw it till it's really tight and then screw just a couple more and then leave it. Go check a hygiene patient, wait, you know, three to five minutes. And many times when I return, the tooth is removed. So you can see it loosened. Take this off and here it comes. So you can see this buckle bone was very thin. So I'm cutting around the tooth into the trabecular bone. That's where the blood supply comes from. If, and I wanna be sure that I've got good connection with the source of blood. So this will heal nicely. Now I use two different methods for bone grafting and extraction site. One is platelet rich fibrin. This, this particular patient had terrible veins. With platelet-rich fibrin, you've got to draw blood from the patient and then spin it down, and the platelet-rich fibrin clot is formed. Uh, that's fantastic if people have good veins. If they've got bad veins, you have to have a larger vein, which usually means from about the elbow, the antecubital fossa, 
up the arm. The hand veins are normally not large enough to draw blood for platelet-rich fibrin. Sometimes I'll use a combination of platelet-rich fibrin and freeze-dried bone, both mineralized and demineralized bone. And, or sometimes I'll use just freeze-dried bone. And in this case, that's what we're doing. This is just maxius mineralized, demineralized, freeze-dried bone. And in many times I will place an implant at the time of extraction if it's a single-rooted tooth. If the bone is compromised, I won't do that. I'll bone graft it and wait six months to place the implant normally, sometimes three months. But if we're not in a hurry, I'd rather wait six months to be sure we've got a nice, uh, that the bone is healed well and it's nice and dense. Then this is contour adapt resorbable collagen membrane. They're, I'm not locked into this particular membrane, but what I like about a membrane is I like it to not be like a starch shirt. I don't want it to have memory. When it gets wet, I want it to adapt to whatever surface you place it on. There's, I hate it when you're using a membrane and it tends to spring up like a starch shirt. You want it to contour and lay over that bone graft. And this does very well. See how it adapts to the, the site. Then I'm suturing this with 4-0 gut suture and you wanna over contour it just a little bit. It's not important that you get absolute primary closure. I want the flaps to be close together, but I'd rather have the blood supply and have a little bit of opening in the flap that has to reflect you know, all the, the tissue away from the bone and lose that blood supply. And so we've got pretty much primary closure. So six months later, local anesthesia. You see how this is healed nicely. Got a good wide uh, horizontal surface. This is the radiograph, nice dense healing. So we've got about 15 millimeters, so that's good. And what I'm trying to do, I'd like to just slightly engage the floor of the sinus. That's good cortical bone, and it creates a very stable uh, implant. Victor Sindax invented the small diameter implant, and I've had lunch with him many times in New York. And he said one of the most significant things you can do is engage the tip of an implant in cortical bone. So I try to engage the tip of the implant. You might read the article in Dentistry Master Classes on sinus uh, penetration with implants. So this is an incision on the palatal surface and interproximally in the sulcus of each of those teeth. Then I'm going to reflect this. Always reflect from the palatal to the facial and then you're just dealing with one flap. Don't ever make your incision right down the center of the extraction site, because then you have to deal with two flaps. You want to just deal with one flap, so incise and reflect from the palate to the facial, then you can deal with just that one flap. Now I'm flattening this, you can see how dense that bone is, I'm flattening that surface just a little bit so it's it is nice and flat and receives the implant better. See so good dense bone. This is a long shank number four carbide burr and I'm making just a tiny divot at the spot where I want to place the implant. Then I'm going to look at it with my occlusal mirror and be sure that's the site. That's the spot. You can also use a surgical guide. We've got some implant videos on how to make a very simple surgical guide so you don't have to guess. This is, this is an easy one to guess on though because you've got adjacent teeth. And then I'm going to come back with a pilot drill and I know I've got 14 millimeters from the alveolar crest to the floor of the sinus. So I want to penetrate about 15 millimeters with my pilot drill. And I'm going to be sure the drill is parallel to the long axis of the cuspid and the bicuspid. And look at it from the, the front and from the side and be sure you're, you're straight up and down parallel to those teeth. You can see this is the pilot drill and it's parallel equidistant between these teeth and parallel to the long axis of the roots of those teeth. See that's perfectly parallel to the adjacent teeth. See it's perfectly parallel. Now 
you want at least a millimeter of bone around the implant. Once you place the implant, you want at least a millimeter of bone around the implant. So be sure you don't go, you don't place it too far to the facial or you'll have to bone graft it again. See, that's perfect. I've just engaged the uh, floor of the sinus and my alignment is just right. Now I'm using the dentist drill system and in this case, we were trying a new implant. We were using a BioRisons implant. But I love the dentist drill system because each of these drills has a shoulder at the correct depth. Like this drill has a shoulder at 2.2, eight millimeters uh, long drill, all the way down to 4.8 width. And it's still, the shoulder is still at eight millimeters. So I'm using this drill, which is 14 millimeters, so from the shoulder to the tip of the drill is 14 millimeters. And the first drill will be 2.2 millimeters in diameter. And you can go all the way to 4.8 millimeters in diameter. So here's my 2.2 millimeter diameter drill, and you can see it stops at that shoulder. So I know that's 14 millimeters. Now this is the BioRisons drill because I'm, I'm trying a new system here. I don't like these drills because it's very difficult to keep up with the depths when you're trying to look at a dark line or a silver line and there's water and there's blood. And most drills are like this. Dentist has the best drill system. There may be other ones with shoulders. I'm just not familiar with them, but I don't like a drill system that doesn't have a shoulder, especially if you're in the lower posterior and you're worried about the inferior alveolar nerve. The scariest part about placing an implant is drilling into the nerve. And so if you've got the shoulder that stops when it reaches the alveolar crest, you don't even have to think about it. So to me, all these dental systems should have drills with shoulders. So I'm not recommending this system. I was just trying a, a new one because we were gonna use this implant. But I like drill systems with shoulders. They're safe. You don't have to worry about it once you establish your depth and take a periaqual radiograph and confirm that you have the right depth and you then you start using that drill system at that depth, you don't have to think about it anymore. With this, I'm trying to gauge my depth by looking at the lines and the, the silver and the dark. I think this is a very good implant system. I just don't like their drills. See, you're trying to gauge it. It's not a problem here, but I would never use this drill system in the lower posterior. These have got about a millimeter of bone, and here's the implant. We're going to torque this to 35 newton centimeters. There's the implant in place. You can see it's just slightly sub alveolar crest. Now here's the healing cap being screwed to place. I never load the implant at the time of placement. You possibly could with a provisional restoration. I grew up ranching, and so when you place a fence post in concrete, if you load, if you wiggle the fence post too fast before the concrete's set up, it comes out, it loosens. So I want that implant to be totally osseointegrated. That's why I don't lose implants, either small, very seldom a small amateur, and I've never lost a root form, but I let it osseointegrate for three months before I impress it, and then it takes another three weeks to a month to get the crown and the uh, implant abutment back. And so it's a total of about four months, and the bone is totally osseointegrated with the implant. 4O suture, and I'll place two to three suture, or as 4O gut suture, We've placed three 4 gut suture. There's the implant. So I'm gonna use a tish, tissue punch to punch through the soft tissue. And then these are rongiers. Remove that little core. Then I'm gonna unscrew my healing cap. Then I'm placing a BioHorizons closed tray impression coping. 
and I really like the closed tray better. They're easier than an open tray. I use a lot of open tray also, but I'm really growing fond of the closed tray because it's so much easier. You snap it into the implant. Got great undercuts. You know it's stable. Take, an impr take a periapical radiograph of that to be sure it's seated completely. And this is a custom tray polyether impression. You can look up how to take those in Dentistry Masterclasses Library. The wash material squirted directly onto the impression coping and to the impression tray. A very accurate impression. You can see how accurate this is. Then a large healing cap is placed in the implant so the tissue will contour. Now we're going to seat the implant abutment and crown. See how the tissue is contoured nicely. And this is a screw retained abutment and crown. So I'm trying it to place, taking a radiograph. And now before we seat it finally, I always like to use a new screw because the laboratory has put the implant abutment and crown onto and off of the model and screwed it in and unscrewed it, screwed it in and unscrewed it. So I always get a fresh screw. And this is Sika Bond Dental Thread Locker. It just keeps the implant screw from unscrewing. Now I had some issues with implant abutment and crown screws unscrewing for about a six month period of time. And I researched everything. And, and found the article that you can read in dentistrymasterclasses.com on prevention of implant, abutment and crown, screw unscrewing. And then also found this material, Sikabond. And you squirt, there's several things, a couple things you do. Number one, you squirt the Sikabond on the screw that's gonna be screwed into the implant. I just rinse it out real well. Tightening 35 newton centimeters. When we placed the Sika bond on the screw tips of the implant and took the radiograph to confirm it was seated completely. Here's the articulating paper, slide occlusal adjustment. I don't want any side movements on the implant crown. That can, that can contribute to screw loosening. So I'm doing everything I can to prevent the screw loosening. You, you just don't want to deal with that if you can help it. The theory is the implant has to settle in the tissue for a little while, and then you can get it that last little bit so you know it's completely torqued to 35 newton centimeters. So torque it to place 35 newton centimeters with the Sika bond, let it sit for 15 minutes, go check a hygiene patient, work on a consult, come back in 15 minutes and torque it to 35 newton centimeters a second time. See, this is a second torque. Then I'm placing plumber's tape in the orifice. You can place cotton ball. This is just easy. And then I'm bonding it with primer adhesive, blow the excess out onto that two by two and cure the primer adhesive. Then I'm placing highly filled uh, resin which this happens to be Filtech Supreme. And using that ball burnisher, curing that for 40 seconds, checking the occlusion. Pour and after, pour and after. That's the dental minute. These techniques work and they work every time.